economists uh, since Adam Smith have a missing gene about uh, national, about nations and about borders because the theme of so much of economics is that borders are artificial and it is trade markets and global that gives prosperity. And I basically believe that also. So I have a missing gene, I know, uh, in uh, being able to think in strong national terms. Because I, I really believe that it's when we have open, connected borders and international life that people achieve what they aim to achieve in prosperity. That's not the whole story of life by any means. There is identity, there's culture, there's, uh, there's uh, people's uh, feelings, beliefs, religion, language. I don't want to minimize that. But from an economic point of view, so much of this is self-destructive because when we divide rather than unify, we almost inevitably crush economic opportunities rather than create economic opportunities. And this comes to uh, a lesson that we haven't talked about of World War I that I want to bring into this discussion about Ukraine, and that is the post-World War I. Maybe it was talked about uh, actually yesterday. I missed, missed it, but I haven't heard it referred to, so I'm going to, to mention it. Of course, the end of World War I is famous for having made a mess of the post-World War I economy, having created uh, the reparations burden on Germany, having created uh, a uh, breakdown, actually, of what had been spreading trade through Europe and what became completely uh, parcelized and divided uh, Europe, which was a uh, cause of the economic crisis of the 1920s and uh, the Depression and the rise of uh, Hitler uh, to power in the 1930s with the economic disaster. And of course, John Maynard Keynes became uh, f famous justly for having written in 1919 in the economic consequences of the peace, the uh, basic insight, which has been disputed but is basically right uh, and, and remains that a harsh peace uh, after World War I was uh, a risk of creating a, a new harsh political environment that could give rise to a uh, regrowth of, uh, of war. And that un unfortunately proved to be the case. So let me uh, fast forward uh, 75 years to the end of uh, the uh, communist period in, uh, where I uh, picked up the story personally in, in 1989. I was asked by the Polish uh, Solidarity Movement, and I'm going in three days to celebrate the 25th anniversary of the first partially free election in this region, which was June 4th, 1989. I was asked by Solidarity to help them devise an economic strategy. And the I was given one sentence as the assignment from Yatsa Koran, who uh, asked me to write this document, which I did. He also asked me unfairly to write it overnight in one night, uh, which I also did. And that was the advantage of having had several Harvard all-nighters. Uh, may maybe the one training I got uh, that, that uh, paid off. Um, but he said the first line should be, this is an economic plan to return to Europe. So the vision of solidarity was to break the artificial divide of uh, 1945 and to try to create a unified Europe. And I wrote a plan that said make trade open almost immediately, make the currency convertible, and I said Poland should rejoin Europe, which was then the European community. I wrote in the document within five years, or at the end of five years. It took 15 years at the end. But the idea was a quick return to Europe. And I can tell you something very particular, which was that everything I suggested 
how to stabilize the currency, emergency funding. The IMF and the U.S. government followed almost to the letter and almost instantaneously. And I thought, gee, that's good. Uh, this is how it should be. This is going to be the difference of 1919 and 1989. Then I came here, and Mr. Markovich asked me to uh, help uh, end the Yugoslav hyperinflation. And I looked at the data, and I said, you know, there is a way to do this. I have an idea. And actually, I had a good idea, which could have worked. And Mr. Markovich made a plan, as uh, many of you will recall, and it went into effect. And then there was no response from the West at all. Uh, simple things like rolling over Yugoslavia's debt proved to be impossible, no interest. It was almost inane, the response from Europe, except Europe didn't want to save Yugoslavia as a country, first of all. And it was already into very particular, this one's on our side, this one's not on our side, and we were beginning to see a very different mentality. I didn't understand that at the time, I just thought they were idiots, frankly, the European uh, side. Unresponsive, un understanding of a hyperinflation. And what I had learned from Keynes as a practicing economist, and what I believe to this day is don't let a crisis just fester, because it will turn into a disaster. You actively try to cure things. You don't just let things take their natural course, because natural courses end up in war. They don't end up in solutions. You have to work for solutions. So then I was asked by Mr. Yeltsin, uh, first by Mr. Gorbachev, who I was happy to try to help. Uh, and uh, that failed miserably when, uh, when uh, we suggest, a group of us suggested uh, to Mr. Gorbachev to appeal to the West for emergency financial support and there was no interest at all at the G8 summit in 1991 and when Gorbachev left the G8 summit that the putsch uh, in August 91 uh, took place in part because they said this guy's got nothing he's you know a failure he can't bring any help to this country disaster Three months later, Mr. Yeltsin uh, called, called me, uh, actually Mr. Gaidar called me and asked me to help. And uh, I had a lot of experience about financial stabilization at that point, and I wrote up uh, the kinds of things that should be done. And you'll see why this is relevant in just a moment. And they are basic things, a standstill on debt servicing, emergency financial lines, some help with canceling unpayable debts. These are standard solutions for a deep financial crisis. I proposed, as in Poland, a stabilization fund for the ruble. In other words, back the currency. Not one of those things was accepted. Complete smackdown, 100%. Not one of them. I've been blamed for many things for 25 years afterwards, which are absurd, because it wasn't about economics, it was about politics. The West, and especially Washington, was just not interested in helping Russia, period. Russia was on the other side of the divide, mentally. This is something that I failed to appreciate and absolutely could not embody in my own imagination. For me, 1992 was a glorious moment of history, a chance for democracy, a chance for unification, a chance for ending Cold War divisions, a chance for uh, creating a new prosperity. I couldn't imagine that Mr. Cheney, who was then Defense Secretary, and his deputy Wolfowitz and others were dreaming up the new American century uh, and dreaming up how to maintain American unipolarity. But they were. And somebody explained it to me, actually. A senior U.S. official said to me, Jeff, I want you to understand, even if your economics is right, and I'm not saying I disagree with you, you're not going to get any of these requests met. You're just not. Understand it. 
My problem is I, I can't hear no very well. Because many times I hear no and it turns into yes, so I never know when no is real or when it's just slowness on the other side. And so I didn't believe this man. He happened to be acting Secretary of State at the time. He knew something about US policy, but he was basically telling me the economics was right, but the politics was wrong. That's what I couldn't dream. I couldn't dream that we wouldn't take this wonderful opportunity to help Russia through a very intense financial crisis, to help it get it back on its feet, and to help create a more unified geopolitical world that didn't have divides in it. Well, nothing like that happened. And Russia went into a very deep financial crisis, not only because of this, because the whole buildup of the Soviet collapse was a mega collapse of a mega wrong economic approach for decades. Let's be clear about that. But there was no help at all from the West. And the Russian crisis was deep. And then the Russian state was completely pillaged by corruption, massive, massive corruption. And when Putin came to power, he could not look at the US in very friendly terms, frankly because this had been stupid behavior by the United States over this period. Thoughtless, cynical, not designed to solve problems. Not as bad as 1919, but nothing like the enlightened approach that could have cemented a solid relationship. It was, it was a way to create doubt, a way to create animosity, a way, a, a way to say the U.S. is in charge and we don't care. And I think this is incredibly short-sighted. And this is, I observe this front and center. Here, to some extent, although I couldn't put the pieces together very well, as I said, I just thought it was stupid politics, but it was geopolitics. And in Russia, it was really geopolitics. And in a way, we're living on that legacy. I don't want to absolve the Russian government of what I regard as absolutely unlawful actions in recent months. But the prelude to it was that we lost an opportunity historically that would have made a very big difference by having a magnanimity in 1989 1991, there was no magnanimity at all. There was just short-sightedness. I can't even tell you, by the way. I mean, I can tell you, but I don't have time to tell you. I went to the IMF and said completely sensible things, knowledgeable things, experienced things, things that had been proven in Poland two years earlier. And the deputy managing director just looked at me and said, no. And I said, why? No. Why? Well, you know why he was saying no. He was saying no because the U.S. government told him to say no. Why wasn't he explaining it? Because he couldn't explain it. Because he was just a pawn of the U.S. government at the time. His assignment was to say no. Okay, this is not how we solve world problems. So that's a backdrop to the feelings of recreating divides. And it surprised me that Europe, too, Europe made it, maybe for technocratic reasons to some extent, this enormous hurdle to get into the European Union. And that created the divide. You're in, you're on this side, you're on the other side. Uh, Russia, of course, no, no way will talk to you, but the real members are here. And when NATO followed uh, EU membership, it just absolutely just shifted the, the barrier. This was not thinking. This really was not thinking. And it especially did not create the conditions for a different kind of approach that really could have been the more unified world that we need.
because not only as an economist would I say that these boundaries are dumb, but I would say they're dangerous. They're dangerous in exactly the way we see them, as we see them becoming dangerous right now. When you have sharp boundaries, then the whole question is, which side are you on? Can Ukraine be pried out of Russia's hands into Europe's hands? This is an absurd question. Look at a map. Ukraine can't be pried anywhere. Ukraine is where it is. And it happens to be next to Russia on one side and next to Europe on another side. It's not a matter of prying it out. And look at where Russia is. Russia is the main part of Russia's population is in Europe. And the main part of Russia's economy, other than some of the oil and gas reserves, are in Europe. And by the way, Russia cannot succeed economically without good relations with Europe. When I went to Moscow in January and participated in a very good forum with senior government officials, I felt the situation economically was pretty good, actually, and that the economy was being pretty well managed. But I thought that what was missing was stronger connections between Russian industry and especially German industry to modernize Russian industry in aeronautics, in automobiles, uh, in information technology, because Russia is operating on one and a half engines right now. One is, of course, the petro economy, and the half engine is manufacturing, which isn't quite internationally competitive, but could be. But for that, it needs strong technological connections with Germany, above all, with Europe more generally, and with the world, not to be closed. So I left Moscow just before the Olympics feeling pretty good. Just one more step, and uh, we're going to have uh, a way, uh, finally, to uh, get the economy properly, uh, pr properly set. Well, you may say that's just my naivete, and there is naivete in it, because I'm always hoping for the better. I'm not making forecasts. I'm trying to aim for the better outcome. And then everything was downhill <clears throat> from then on. And I do believe that both sides of this, though I hate to think of them as sides, but of course it's both sides, have a responsibility for what is, what's happened. The Europe and the United States acted provocatively, I do believe, uh, and uh, pushed in certain ways. So did Russia. I do believe that Russia has international legal responsibilities to the territorial integrity of Ukraine, which it has violated, and which I think is a very serious violation. There's quite a solemn commitment made in 1994, in addition to the normal uh, international law, which says that in return of the nuclear weapons from Ukraine, Russia commits to guaranteeing the territorial integrity of Ukraine. And this is fundamental. How are we ever going to get nuclear weapons under control, as Nina said, if we don't honor such commitments in such contexts? So I'm not happy with what's happened. I understand it. But I'm not at all happy or uh, relieved by these tensions. I find them extremely, uh, extremely serious. Uh, and. Uh, very uh, dangerous, actually. The truth is that none of the big powers right now is respecting international law. And this is the big danger for the whole world. Certainly a big danger for all small countries, but it's actually a big danger for all countries. We can't just choose international law when we want to. I was completely uh, on uh, the uh, Russian and Chinese side, if I may say so, uh, during the debate over Syria. Because to my mind, when the U.S. says uh, Assad must go, that's a violation of international law. I don't like any country saying some other leader must go. We can't have a world like that where some power dictates 
who runs another country, much less when that leader doesn't go that we funnel arms or logistics or money to a rebellion. That's completely in violation of international law. And it continues to this day. And, and uh, President Obama reconfirmed U.S. Syrian policy uh, just in his speech at West Point a few days ago. And then he proclaimed U.S. commitment to international law. That's a kind of blindness. That is American hubris. It's not really acceptable. It's extremely dangerous. And I completely sided, by the way, with Russia when Russia and China complained about the Libya operation. You know, that really was a case, convince Gaddafi to give up his nuclear and other ambitions and then kill him because they got tired of him. We can't go on actually like this. Every local rebellion you say, okay, we support you because so and so must go and then send in NATO planes. That's not acceptable. And so I was, found myself very much on Russia's side on these arguments, but not on Ukraine, because it's the same behavior the other direction, it seems to me. It's no more justified. There's territorial integrity. There's a national commitment. So I don't take sides on these issues. I'm on the side trying, naively as it is, to come to the defense of two propositions. One is that we shouldn't draw artificial economic lines. We should try to make a global world economy because that's going to be the best hope for everybody. And second, that we should honor international law and stop playing games when it's to our convenience or not to our convenience. And not to say, as President Obama did a few days ago, I believe to the core American exceptionalism, then he said, because we're exceptional and that we defend international law. Well, not quite. Because if you listen to American presidents, all of them, they say, we will always choose our own, not what the UN tells us to do. That's not international law. International law says that in, except for self-defense, you have to have a Security Council resolution. You don't get to choose. That's our hope for peace. That is the difference of 1914 and what we hope for today. So these are reasons why I regard the Ukraine crisis as very serious and why I really hope that what we're seeing right now is uh, some cooling off now that the presidential election has taken place. An experienced, seasoned Ukrainian politician has been elected president. I think he's making the right uh, statements about uh, seeking uh, a peaceful working relationship with Russia. This strikes me as extremely uh, sensible and, uh, and correct. And what I do know, again, and I'll close here, speaking with an economist's uh, hat on one more time, Russia cannot gain by this in any way. It's actually not even the case that it's testing whether Germany will or won't follow through on sanctions. That's too superficial a way to understand the dynamics of this. If Ukraine is destabilized, if there were to be a border crossing of Russian troops uh, into eastern Ukraine under any pretext, it doesn't matter right now what the leaders think about sanctions. The breakdown of economic relations will be extraordinary. And Russia's prosperity depends not on signing another deal with China, though that's fine, not on the Eurasian Union, whatever. It depends on Russia being part of the world economy. And it depends on Russia being well integrated with high technology world, not with low technology neighbors, but with a high technology world. Because that's Russia's hope for reaching the prosperity that it seeks. And so that's why I hope this crisis is on its waning days now, because it's an extremely dangerous one for all of us, and it's extremely dangerous for Russia as well. I think Serbia's present position is, uh, is prudent and uh, also compatible with its coming role in the OSCE. 
just to uh, try to be constructive but not to take a side in this. And I think that that's clearly uh, what uh, the, the government is doing and it seems completely uh, appropriate to me. Um, I did want to uh, answer Nina in, in one, uh, one regard, which is that you never know whether uh, taking the option of hoping for the best will work or not. But in general in life, it's better to try that than to presume the failure. And so I think that I'm happy to, be, uh, to go through life naively optimistic because uh, there's a functional approach to that, which is that once in a while you're right and you actually get a good outcome. Uh, you surprise a lot of people. Of course you're disappointed. Life is filled with disappointments. But better to be disappointed after having tried the right thing than to be confirmed in your disappointment for not having tried. And I can only tell you, you know, even I'll tell you a, a story that was, may seem a little bit peculiar uh, also. When, when Poland first made these, this transition uh, in 1989, uh, I wrote this plan and uh, I put forward these ideas that, I, as I said, were ultimately accepted. But at the first moment, the IMF technical team rejected all of them and I had a kind of showdown with them uh, in a hotel in Warsaw. And they said, these are the same people as six months ago. Nothing's really changed here. Uh, why would you give help to these people? You know, they're the same people that cheated before and defaulted before. And it was a cynical senior bureaucrat, by the way, very nice man. Uh, but no, really a very nice man, but uh, basically just doing the normal thing. And I, I looked at him in disbelief. I said, are you kidding? You know, you're in charge of a region that's just had the biggest geopolitical change in 50 years and you're saying nothing's changed? Are you kidding? You're not going to try? And believe me, if you don't try, I'm going to blast the hell out of you uh, for, for failure to try. Not that that makes so much of a difference, but it gives me a little bit of opportunity to release steam. Uh, and uh, they ended up, the U.S. had a different point of view and ended up following the ideas of actually doing something. So I don't, you may be right, uh, you may be completely right, substantively, that uh, there could not have been a big reform early on, that it wasn't ready. Russia was as difficult and confused as any place I've ever worked in my whole life, which is more than 100 countries, uh, in 1992. It was a terribly difficult circumstance. And of course, I'm no expert in any of this. I'm, uh, you know, I'm, I'm the worst thing possible. I'm an economist uh, that uh, you know does not know all of the uh, the details, the history, the intricacies of local politics, and so forth. But I do believe that the stance of hope, rather than the stance of resignation or uh, feeling that things must go on, is generally the right approach to take because life sometimes surprises in, in a very positive way. And I think we didn't act with hope. I think we acted with uh, maybe prejudice. realism, oh, prejudice. maybe true. prejudice, uh, maybe uh, cynicism because Mr. Cheney is one of the most cynical people that we've ever had in public life in the United States. Uh, and that's a serious uh, comment, not just a, you know, this is, he got us into a disaster globally. Uh, and I think that this kind of cynicism is, is the big danger. And when you look at the history of World War I, which is what has brought us here, we fall into World War I because in the end, every actor took the worst scenario of the counterpart. Uh, and this is what leads to disaster in the end. And in that book, which you kindly mentioned uh, when your grandfather and uh, President Kennedy made peace in 1963. It was precisely because each of them reached beyond their own, uh, their own advisors who would have killed the world a million times over. 
and they, they actually both said, I can do something with my counterpart, they're human beings. That was a very unusual position to take, by the way. That's why I love that speech of President Kennedy, which I quoted last night, and uh, for those of you who were at the dinner, and for those not, it was a speech on peace that he gave, and it was a unique speech from the point of view of an American president, because the whole speech in 1963, it's unbelievable. Rather than telling the Soviet Union what to do, and their militaries were tied to the Soviet Union, and the two sides, the U.S., led alliance NATO and the Soviet-led alliance, the Warsaw Pact, faced down each other's uh, uh, tank uh, uh, turrets uh, and, and uh, right. uh, gun sites and, and actually came face to face in, in uh, tank confrontations in Berlin in 1962, uh, one of the events that nearly led us, uh, or end of 61, I guess, uh, that led us to the brink of nuclear war. And Gorbachev, as a man of peace who wanted to reunify Europe, he didn't want to end the Soviet Union, but he wanted to reunify Europe and reform the Soviet Union, knew that his uh, part, his side was in crisis and needed reform. But it, it wasn't uh, uh, that uh, they didn't have options, but Gorbachev's option was, let's make peace. Right. Uh, we will stay, step down from the military alliance, and NATO said, we too, we won't extend. Now, the long and the short of it is uh, the U.S. cheated, as usual, uh, because uh, we typically cheat because we are powerful, uh, and power brings impunity. Right. You do what you want. No one's going to stop us from that. And literally, in the White House in 1992, uh, the neoconservatives uh, led by Cheney and Wolfowitz and Rumsfeld and others uh, were saying, oh, my God, now we don't have an enemy. Now we are the unipolar power. We're the sole superpower in the world. We do what we want. And they already started to plan a number of wars that were going to end the regimes that had sided with the Soviet Union and so forth. Well, they didn't recognize there was a, another world possible now. There was Russia that wanted normal relations. There was Gorbachev before Yeltsin that wanted normal relations. I was there. I know what they wanted. They wanted normalcy. They wanted peace. But the U.S. got the idea, okay, now it's time for us to extend NATO. Now, the first expansion was to Hungary, Poland, and the Czech Republic, Central Europe, right. not on Russia's border, in 1999 provocative against what we had promised, but not a dire direct threat to Russia. Russia complained, but it wasn't up against Russia. Then came NATO bombing of Serbia, a close ally of Russia in 1999, bombing Belgrade for several weeks. Now that kind of uh, miffed uh, this, the Russian leadership saying, yeah, you're supposed to be a defensive alliance, you're bombing our ally. Then came George W. Bush and uh, his intention to extend NATO basically on an unlimited scale in the region. So he expanded NATO to seven countries, uh, the three Baltic states right up against Russia's border now, two, Balt uh, two uh, Black Sea states, uh, Romania and Bulgaria, and Slovenia and Slovakia, seven during uh, his uh, eight-year period. But the main uh, bombshell, if I could call it that, came in 2008 at the Bucharest NATO summit when the United States insisted that NATO get ready for enlargement to Ukraine and to Georgia. Mm -hmm. Now, if you look at a map, you can see that we are then, first of all, right up against Russia's border yes. with the U.S. alliance. And Georgia, my God, look at a map. That is not a North Atlantic state. Remember, NATO is the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. The idea clearly was to surround Russia in the Black Sea. Mm -hmm. Why the Black Sea? Because that's where Russia's naval fleet is. Right. And even uh, U.S. strategists wrote very clearly that uh, if Russia is bottled up, if the U.S. controls essentially Ukraine, 
Then Russia ceases to be a major power. The U.S. gains a great advantage uh, in geopolitics and in, in its role in Eurasia. So we played out that game, we thought, with yeah. uh, NATO expansion. In 2013, things went red hot because Russia had a neighbor in Ukraine, a president at the time, Viktor Yanukovych, who was a pro-Russian politician uh, and uh, led Ukraine to declare neutrality in 2010. And this calmed down things because Ukraine itself said, no, thank you. We don't want NATO. Uh, we want to be neutral. We don't want to get uh, these two superpowers fighting over us. Right. But then the United States clearly played a role in the overthrow of Yanukovych at the end of 2013 and early 2014. I saw that with my own eyes, actually, because after Yanukovych was overthrown, I was asked to go to uh, Kiev to talk with the new government about the economic crisis. And I went. And when I was there, I was shown around by uh, NGOs of the U.S. explaining the direct role that they had played in the Maidan overthrow of Yanukovych. And we also caught Victoria Nuland, who's currently our Undersecretary of State for Political Affairs, on the phone planning the post-Yanukovych government in Kiev. Mm -hmm. oh, but don't listen to those tapes. Uh, let's keep focus. Exactly. Uh, you know? Yeah, uh, so don't, we don't told, look at how we got here. <laughs> yes, we, we were told we had nothing to do with that. This right. was uh, uh, just a public insurrection. Well, at that point, Russia, from that moment on, we've been at war, basically, because yeah. uh, Russia said the U.S. is pushing yeah. absolutely uh, and is aiming to corner us. That's the Russian perception. You may say exaggerated or not. I think there's a, a lot in that perception, frankly. But since the overthrow of Yanukovych, Russia has viewed this issue of NATO enlargement as a dire threat. Now, fast forward to 2021. But with one uh, sentence, we funded massively the Ukrainian army between 2014 and 2021. That's why it's fighting right now. We poured in billions and billions of dollars. Russia watched that, of course, saying, my God, this is becoming an American-based uh, army, uh, effectively, American hardware. Then came Biden. I thought, OK, maybe, maybe something will cool off. Quite the contrary. Biden just played the deep state game. Uh, I don't know who's really calling the shots, frankly, but Biden said, basically, we're in a struggle with Russia. And three times in 2021, the United States at the highest levels reaffirmed that Ukraine would be a member of NATO. Uh, and this was at the 2021 NATO meeting and in a State Department strategic document with Ukraine and in a Defense Department strategic document with Ukraine. Well, at the end of 2021, Biden, uh, Putin said, look, this is completely uh, unacceptable for our security interests. And he put down uh, demands, if you could call it that, that NATO must stop enlarging and we need to negotiate over this. I, at that point, called the White House and I said, for heaven's sake, negotiate. This is real. And NATO enlargement isn't even desirable for Ukraine. It's not desirable for us. We would never tolerate such a situation, say, Mexico deciding, oh, we want a military alliance with China. Right. And Washington says, no problem, of course. Mm -hmm. You know, we can't even imagine because we don't even attempt for an iota to put ourselves in the other position to understand what this means. That's why we get so many things wrong, because we don't think we have to understand anything. We have exactly. to make up their narrative and our narrative because we're the United States of America. We're so powerful. So the, the upshot of it was Biden said we will never negotiate over Ukraine's right to join NATO. That's never going to be on the table. They call it the open door policy as if the U.S. has the right to form military alliances anywhere, irrespective of the security implications for other countries 
and our in the own. neighborhood, we, which we would <laughs> never accept. We have something called the Monroe Doctrine, right. which told Europe, don't even dream of doing what we do routinely. Right. Well, the war came, and then what I said at the beginning, we are now in, we're in an extraordinarily dangerous moment because Russia views this war as core to its security. The United States, because the Ukrainians are fighting anyway, so it's not on our ground, says we're just going to continue to fight to defeat Putin. We don't even hide it. Uh, in fact, I think we go out of our way not to hide it. Biden saying this man cannot remain in power. The U.S. Uh, Secretary of Defense saying our goal is to weaken Russia. Zelensky uh, just about every day not uh, even talking about Ukraine's interests, but mocking Russia, mocking Russia. So the idea is humiliation. They think uh, that, uh, you know, perhaps uh, uh, this will lead to Putin's overthrow. After all, you know, Yanukovych was overthrown. I don't know what dreams or gambles or whatever they're playing, but boy, are they playing with fire. Yeah. And they're playing with fire on our heads. And I profoundly resent it. And I'm shocked by the complete lack of any debate in the U.S. Congress on this. You know a lot more about that than I do. But I just cannot believe that we don't have a full-fledged debate about how dangerous this situation is. Exactly. And one thing I'd, I'd like to read, uh, Tulsi, you know how much I admire President Kennedy for not having blown up the world 60 years ago in the Cuban Missile Crisis when yes. all his advisors said bomb. And they also had everything wrong as usual. They said, well, the, the missiles in Cuba aren't, aren't ready, but they were ready. And we would have had a nuclear war. But Kennedy sussed it out properly and understood that we needed compromise. We needed diplomacy. We needed to pe peace. So he removed uh, American missiles from Turkey. Uh, Khrushchev removed the Soviet missiles from uh, Cuba. And afterwards, the two leaders exchanged letters saying, my God, this world's crazy. We need to pull back from the brink. And the following year, they signed the Partial Nuclear Test Ban Treaty. Right. And in the lead up to that treaty, Kennedy made the greatest speech of an American president in modern history. And I urge everybody to get online June 10, 1963, the American commencement speech, also known as his peace speech, because he lays out how you preserve the peace. But one thing that he said, and I want to read it because Please. I think it's, it's so striking. He said in this speech, above all, while defending our own vital interests, nuclear powers must avert those confrontations which bring an adversary to a choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. To adopt that kind of course in the nuclear age would be evidence only of the bankruptcy of our policy or of a collective death wish for the world. Listen to what he's saying. Do not confront a nuclear adversary with the choice of either a humiliating retreat or a nuclear war. I can't think of a closer description to what we are actually doing right now yeah. than that. It yeah. is the precise description of what is actually underway in the United States. Uh, we are aiming to humiliate this person. And we're doing it, and we are risking nuclear war, and then we're told by our leaders, and I don't know, I don't know what they're thinking, honestly. I don't have a clue as to what's really in their minds, but they're telling us, don't worry about it. Exactly. My, I, my advice is worry. <laughs> worry. Completely. Call your c congressmen, say, this is crazy. Stop this. Yeah. I think, I think, I mean, gosh, everything that you're saying is obviously so directly on point as far as 
how we how we got to this position and how completely our leaders are absolutely failing us. Um, it seems as though they have a death wish to the world in the way in which, you know, they're talking about oh, the use of tactical uh, nuclear weapons and strategic nuclear weapons as though a nuclear war can possibly be contained or limited and can be won. Tulsi, it's a, it, just, just a, sorry yeah. to interrupt. But no, no, no. You know, you, you, you read in their newspaper articles, will Putin use uh, nuclear weapons? What is his arsenal? Let's have a look. Exactly. As if this is the most normal thing in the world. Yes. Yes. And and as though as though like okay, so he's got, you know, what is it? Over 6,000 nuclear warheads. We've got over 5,000 as though like, oh, that's going to make a difference than if he had 2,000 because if he had fewer and launched fewer nuclear weapons that that would somehow limit the impact of of truly the nuclear holocaust that that one nuclear attack would launch not not just in one country in Europe but but on the world sparking world war 3 and i think i think the fact that politicians are not talking about this the mainstream media is certainly not talking about it, except in the in, in a nonchalant way as though, hey, yeah, this is no big deal. Let's just have a conversation about it. But like you said, it should raise a huge waving red flag of concern to everybody at home that there is no debate on this in Congress. And that if anybody tries to bring this up, they immediately are labeled as you and I have been and continue to be as, oh, well, you're just a, Pu uh, a Putin puppet. You are an apologist for this terrible dictator. You are this, all of this name calling and smearing without ever actually just going to the substance of the conversation. We can have exactly. a debate on the role of NATO and whether it should be enlarged or not, or Russia's intent or this and that. But the fact that there is no credible debate on the fact that we are on the brink of nuclear war because of the decisions that American leaders and leaders in NATO have made and continue to make, refusing to choose a path towards, a path towards peace and diplomacy, refusing to recognize the threat to the world, we are in this position because of that. And I think it, it goes to, um, you know, this recent news of how our, our federal uh, Department of Health and Human Services is now purchasing drugs to use in a radiological and nuclear emergency for the American people as though like, yeah, no big deal. We'll give you a couple of pills or inject you with some drugs so that you can withstand a nuclear attack. Uh, I'm sure you saw the, the PSA that New York City put out saying, hey, uh, if there is a nuclear attack, get inside, stay inside, and stay tuned. Uh, we saw, re you know, back in in our uh, nuclear missile at uh, attack scare that we had in Hawaii. You know, everybody got the text message a couple of years ago saying, "Hey, missile incoming! Seek shelter immediately. This is not a drill." But like everyone in Hawaii realized immediately when we thought, "Hey, we've got 15 minutes to live," there is no shelter. There's no place to go. Of course, it's so, all of this is so cruel, so macabre, so surrealistic, so stupid, uh, so phony. Uh, we used to have in my childhood, the duck and cover, get under your desk. Exactly. That, that'll save you. Right. Uh, you know, it is hard to imagine, uh, hard to understand what anyone is thinking right now in the leadership That's in Washington. That's exactly what I'm if, wondering. If they, if they are thinking at all, I, I try to reach out because I know a number of these people, they're not interested, they don't want to hear it, they're not talking, they are provoking. There are big mysteries, by the way, that as everything, because everything is a lie and everything is classified. But in mid-March, we got reports that from the Turkish mediators, that Russia and Ukraine were close to an agreement. And both the Ukrainian and the Russian negotiators confirmed that, and they exchanged papers. And then you hear from the US, no, ah, we don't think these are going anywhere. Right. These negotiations aren't going anywhere. And then Biden flew to Brussels to meet with the other NATO leaders, and he said, this is gonna be a long war. He didn't say this is promising news. He said this is going to be a long war. Then he went to Warsaw and he said that man cannot stay in power. Yeah. And then Lloyd Austin said uh, we're weakening Russia. You see 
it has all of the hallmarks of us torpedoing the negotiations. Can I prove it? No, because they don't tell us anything and everything is a lie. But what I can see is that the United States government has never in this whole crisis stood up and said, we want to see effective negotiations and we support them. We thank Turkey for being a, a mediator. We call on both sides to reach an agreement. Mm -hmm. We are dead set against that because these neocons have had this fantasy world for 30 years that this is the US world and that this is the unipolar world. And if we want to expand NATO, we're going to expand NATO and no one's going to stop us, nuclear threats or not. And that's where we are right now. So so you're saying this go this goes back 30 years. I want to go back to your description of what happened in kind of that immediate post-Soviet era. The Warsaw Pact was dissolved. Was there ever a debate or conversation at that time saying, OK, if the Warsaw Pact is resolved, then what purpose is there for NATO to exist in the first place? If, if NATO existed as a counterbalance towards uh, the Soviet threat or pressure, well, if the Warsaw Pact is gone, does NATO have a purpose? And if NATO does exist, was Russia ever invited to join? So very interesting. There were, of course, people who had that thought and some senior people and some very clever people. Bill Perry, who was our defense secretary yeah. under Clinton. And Perry looked for ways for NATO to reach out to really try to bring Russia into a trustful relationship so this becomes a security alliance, not a confrontational alliance. And he describes in his memoirs how much progress he made and the personal relations he forged with senior Russian officials and the institutional progress. Then he says, then he started hearing my word in the State Department, they're pushing for NATO enlargement. Hmm. And he starts asking around, what is this? And it's Madeleine Albright and, uh, and uh, Holbrook, Richard Holbrook. And he says, this is a terrible idea. We're just at a fragile stage right now where we're building trust, building relations. Why would you start to do this? And he doesn't understand that it's a done deal because he's been played bureaucratically. And he goes to see Clinton and Clinton says, yes, I'm considering and so on. And, and then Clinton decides, OK, we're going to expand NATO because Clinton, I think, regarded this in his uh, local political terms as a good move for the 1996 elections, maybe. Who knows? You mm. never know because it's Jeez. so flaky, this kind of thing. And Perry writes in his memoirs, I debated, should I resign at that moment? You know, because this was a big deal. Then, this is already 26 years ago. So wow. this isn't something that just came with us. Yeah. Perry debates resigning. And then he says, I decided not to resign. And then now I don't know. I've thought about it for the last 20 years. Should I have resigned at that point? And what's also striking is that our senior statesman, who I appreciate more and more as I get older and know more and have seen more, George Kennan, mm -hmm. who was the author of the containment policy in 1947 against the Soviet Union, but always meant it to be a non-military kind of containment and always emphasized there's, a, there's an off-ramp to the Cold War. And he bemoaned the whole Cold War approach of a, of a thermonuclear arms race. He thought this was madness. When Clinton went ahead with the NATO enlargement, Kennan immediately said, this is the start of the new Cold War. Striking. Mm. The, the, the person, I think, most sensitive to Russian history in the 20th century. And he knew immediately that we were on a new path of confrontation because he understood the U.S. government and he understood the Russian government. And he called it, that was in 1997, I believe, that he stated that, so 25 years ago. So the whole narrative right now is that this came out of nowhere. Right. And if you say NATO enlargement, like you say, you're, you're mocked, you're laughed at, you're called a Putin apologist, 
you're put on uh, some Ukraine list as a, a <laughs> as propagator <we> <laughs> of propaganda and so on. And, you know, the, the truth is we don't hear the truth about a lot of things these days no. uh, because we are a security state where everything is, uh, is, is confidential. Everything is hidden from the public. Uh, all these decisions that we're talking about, the life and death decisions of the planet are being made by a handful of people, a handful of people. That's the real situation of American political system. That is not the democracy we talk about of deliberation and congressional hearings. And, and we don't have champions like we had in the past. Whereas a, a J. William Fulbright, uh, who talked about the arrogance of power and who warned against the Vietnam War and people that I knew growing up who were able to stand against uh, this uh, monolithic militaristic viewpoint, but we don't have that right now. So it's uh, extraordinarily dangerous. Well, what is your message to people, to the American people and, and people of the world right now in uh, who are hearing this, who are understanding the gravity of, of this crisis that we are facing? We're literally, as we sit here, maybe tomorrow, maybe in a week, maybe in a month, we could be in a situation where World War III is sparked, uh, where a nuclear war has begun, and we are on the path towards destruction of this world as we know it, destruction of life as we know it. The 2024 election is a few years away still, so yes, it's, we have an election here in the United States coming up in a few weeks. It's important to vote, but what can we do right now? You know, I was uh, just on a call with a wonderful peace group in Brooklyn, New York, uh, and uh, they asked the question. And I thought that one thing they could do immediately was uh, call the New York congressmen and congresswomen and say, we want you online right now yeah. to talk to us. We don't want to hear from your staff. We don't want to hear we're too busy. This is life and death. And we want to speak to you. We don't just want to hear from you. We want to speak to you because it's your job also to keep us safe. And I would like people all over the country to call their congressmen and congresswomen and get them online with communities because we don't have to uh, just assume that somewhere far off in Washington, they're doing the right thing. We don't have to wait for them to, uh, to, to run 100 miles to, to find them someplace. We can have the same kind of Zoom with them as we're having right now and demand that they do their job. They're not doing their job. And, and, and this that... is the biggest problem because in the US Constitution, Congress declares war, yeah. but we don't have a constitutional order. We have a security state. And the security state means that we are in the hands of a few people and frankly, I don't trust their judgment right now. They've got a terrible, terrible track record. I know there's a lot of people uh, across the United States who are concerned for the well-being of the people of Ukraine, uh, people who are putting Ukrainian flags out uh, in front of their homes, and uh, who feel very compassionate towards the pain and the suffering that they're seeing play out on the television. A little less these days, but it was 24-7 when the invasion first began. Um, what, what, it, what is your message to them when we say, hey, tell our members of Congress, tell the president to do the right thing? Can you paint the picture of what that is for the American people who are trying to figure out what is the right thing to do uh, to, to do good? Yeah, we say uh, our government says we love Ukraine, but they're loving them to death. Literally. You know, putting, you, putting Ukraine in between NATO and Russia, it's going to be Ukraine that's going to that's going to receive the first nuclear attack if there is one. Right. So we're not doing any favors to Ukraine right now. Yeah. We should be pushing both sides to negotiate for peace. And the idea of that this war is helping Ukraine. No, uh, we're helping Ukraine the same way we helped Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other words, we are leveling this country by our armaments, their armaments, our HIMARS, their missiles. This is not helping Ukraine. I absolutely want to help the Ukrainian people. I advised the Ukrainian government. I've been 
involved with Ukraine from the beginning. My message is not about pro-Russia or pro-Ukraine. It is about peace exactly. so that everybody can survive. And if you fly the flag for Ukraine, absolutely. But that doesn't mean that the way to protect Ukraine is NATO weaponry in an escalation to nuclear war. That's no protection at all. It's astonishing to me how the president of the United States and all of his emissaries in different ways continue to repeat the talking point over and over and over again. Well, this is Putin's war. You know, increasing gas prices are because of Putin's war. Uh, supply shortages are because of Putin's war. There's no when asked directly, hey, when does this war end? When do we kind of like, when do we cut things off? And Biden says, well, that's up to Putin, uh, putting everything on Putin's doorstep as though the United States of America is a powerless entity that is passive in all of this. I think the the leverage that the United States has, obviously because of the money and arms and everything that are pouring into Ukraine, uh, is is probably the most powerful in the world to push for peace. And it's not just leverage uh, about our leverage in Ukraine and so forth. This war is about the United States. So it's absolutely direct. At the beginning of the war, uh, Chancellor Schultz of Germany went to Putin and said, uh, you know, I guarantee NATO won't expand while I'm chancellor. And Putin laughed at him and said, yeah, how, how long are you going to be chancellor? Mm -hmm. He wants to talk to Biden. Right. Let's get real. This is a U.S.-led alliance. And so this is about the United States. And we need to sit down to negotiate. And we, the American people, need to demand that our leaders sit down to negotiate. It was, it was about the Russia. Very clear. Poland was on our side. Russia was on the other side. Uh, remember the mentality of the Cold War. Poland was a captive country under the Soviet domination. Now it was free. We grab Poland to our side. By 1999, Poland had become a member of NATO. Uh, and also, even politically, there were many, many Polish Americans in the United States and voters also. So this was a natural constituency politically, uh, of course, to help Poland. Uh, also, you know, Poland is a Catholic country and Pope John Paul II uh, it was Pope. Uh, so this was, uh, you know, freedom for our people. But Russia, psychologically, geopolitically, was viewed, that's the other side. That's the mystery of deep Asia. That's uh, tyranny and, and uh, despotism. Uh, even though Yeltsin was saying, look, we want a normal economy. We want a normal relationship with the United States. We want to end the Cold War. We're, we're done with the, with the Soviet era. It didn't matter. Uh, there wasn't the imagination in the U.S. to say, we, we can do something different. I tried. Uh, I think it was, uh, it, it required a, a viewpoint. The, the other thing that happened was the real U.S. right wing came to the dominance, which was strange because you would have thought at the end of the Cold War, people could move to the center. But actually, the, what we call the neoconservatives really came to the forefront then saying, now we're alone, we're the most powerful, we can do everything, we're the unipolar world. And they created the mindset that now the United States can clean up all this mess after the end of the Cold War, even by overthrowing the governments in the Middle East that were allied with the Soviet Union or with Russia. It's not an accident that the United States went to war in Iraq, in Syria, and in Libya in the next 20 years, because those were three countries that had been allied with the Soviet Union. And the idea was now we clean up the mess left behind so that we install U.S. friendly countries in these places, uh, U.S. friendly governments in these three countries. So that was the mindset. It's a kind of crazy mindset. Of course, those three wars were disasters. Uh, the Iraq war broke up the country, divided the world. Uh, the intervention in Syria 
to overthrow Assad failed completely, and uh, President Assad is still there. The U.S. is mostly out. And then in Libya was the overthrow of Muammar Gaddafi, but it left behind a, a civil war. So each time the U.S. intervened, it was a mess. But it's, it's not an accident, those three countries. Those were the three Soviet allied countries, Saddam Hussein, Bashar al-Assad, and Muammar Gaddafi, and the United States went after all three of them. Uh, Professor Sachs, we, we know that right after the collapse of the Soviet Union, Clinton, we, we know that we know when, when, when Yeltsin get elected, got elected, we, front page Time magazine, it was his photo. What, but, but Clinton, right after the collapse of Soviet Union, start expanding NATO. And I want to know what was the Yeltsin's reactions in those days? Well, the, the timing is uh, interesting because in 1990, as part of the end of the Cold War, the United States and Germany promised to Gorbachev that NATO will not move one inch eastward. And this is in the U.S. archives. There's a nice collection online that shows all of the promises that were made by the United States and Germany <coughs> to Gorbachev. So it was clear to the U.S. and, and Germany, to Helmut Schmidt, uh, that you couldn't just end the Cold War without making a reciprocal promise to Gorbachev that if Gorbachev would end the Soviet military alliance, which was called the Warsaw Pact, then the United States military alliance, NATO, would not take advantage of that. So that was the promise. But I think already by 1992, with Gorbachev gone from power, the neoconservatives started thinking, ah, we don't, we don't really have to honor that. Then Clinton came in, and for the first couple of years, I don't know what they were saying internally, but it was not a live issue. And actually, uh, there was an attempt of NATO and the Russian military to form a kind of trusted relationship. But then, Starting really in 1995, 96, uh, the policy of the Clinton administration became to expand NATO. And exactly why that is, is not clear to me. But I can say first, the first thing is they thought they could. You know, the U.S. is the superpower, can do what it wants. So part of it is just arrogance. Then they said, any promises we made to Gorbachev, forget it. Gorbachev's gone, Soviet Union's gone. But that's also not true because Russia is the continuation state of the Soviet Union. You make a promise to one, you're supposed to honor your promise to the continuation state. <laughs> so they cheated on that. We had a pretty hardline Secretary of State, Madeleine Albright, from Central Europe. Well, she wanted to move NATO to Central Europe. And Clinton had a debate inside his cabinet. The defense secretary at the time, William Perry, was against NATO expansion. Madeleine Albright was for NATO expansion. Clinton chose NATO expansion. Perry thought, maybe I should resign. Uh, he wrote about it in his memoirs. Even a dozen years or 20 years later, he was wondering, should I have resigned? Uh, he was, wasn't sure that he did the right thing. He stayed in, in office, but they went ahead with the NATO expansion. So it was actually in 1999 that Poland, the Czech Republic, and Hungary joined NATO. I think even that break was not decisive for what happened because those three countries are in Central Europe. They don't border the Soviet Union. They had been occupied by the Soviet Union for decades. Uh, one could even imagine the Russians being quite unhappy, which they were, but realizing they're not going to be able to push the point more. But then George W. Bush Jr. came into power in January 20, 2001. 
And he really accelerated this. So seven more countries joined NATO during the Bush period. And these were pretty provocative because it was three Baltic states, part of the former Soviet Union and right on the Russian border, and two countries in the Black Sea, Romania and Bulgaria, and also Slovenia and Slovakia. Okay, this was already, Putin was getting pretty furious and saying, you're crossing our neighborhood, you're crossing our red lines, uh, and what about all the promises once upon a time you made? But the real coup de grace came <coughs> in 2008, when Bush, in his last year of office, insisted that NATO commit to enlarge to Ukraine and to Georgia. And then Putin said, you must be kidding. This is our immediate backyard. This is more than 1,200 kilometers of border, and you're talking about putting a military alliance up against our border. This is where our naval fleet is in the Black Sea, and you're talking about surrounding us with Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia in the Black Sea, and our port, our naval port, uh, Sevastopol and Crimea. So he said, no, no. And he said to George W. Bush Jr. in 2008, you expand NATO to Ukraine, Russia will take back Crimea. He already told him, you're crossing the line on this. And then a pro-Russian president was elected in Ukraine, uh, Viktor Yanukovych, who was seeing, my God, our country's in between these two superpowers. So Yanukovych said, we go for neutrality. We don't want to be members of NATO. We don't want to be a war zone. So the uh, Ukrainian parliament adopted neutrality, and it was a little quiet. And in late 2013 and early 2014, uh, a mass uprising took place uh, called the Maidan Revolution. And the United States played a role in stoking it. It was partly popular, partly U.S. driven. We can't tell exactly the dynamics, but definitely the U.S. meddled as it does. Definitely there was some uh, natural politics to it. But the upshot of it was that Yanukovych was overthrown. And the new government that came in was an all NATO, all Europe, we're going for the West. And uh, that's when, uh, when Putin uh, took back Crimea uh, and uh, when the war started. It was in, after, the, after the overthrow of the, the government. Of course. It was provoked by the overthrow directly, not even any question. You overthrew our pro-Russian president. We can't tolerate this. Now you've crossed the line for our national security. And they organized a referendum in Crimea <coughs> and uh, a, uh, a uh, Russia-backed uh, insurgency began in eastern Ukraine, which was predominantly or heavily uh, Russian-speaking uh, people. And that's really when the war started in 2014. So it didn't really start in 2022. It started in 2014, immediately after the insurrection led over. In his backyard in Cuba, why Putin doesn't have, why, why Putin cannot feel an existential threat at his doorstep at, in, 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 in Ukraine? It, it's very uh, analogous that uh, when Fidel Castro in 1960, after the Cuban Revolution, turned to the Soviet Union, it did not take long, by the way, for Eisenhower first to say, okay, now we invade Cuba. <laughs> because uh, uh, immediately the CIA put together a plan to invade Cuba because Cuba with a military alliance with the Soviet Union, hell no. So the United States, of course, if, by the way, if Mexico 
announced one day, we really like China and we're entering a military alliance with China. And Washington says Ukraine can make whatever choice it wants, so we want to make whatever choice we want. It would probably be a war in 20 minutes. Uh, the United States would never, never tolerate it, the U.S. government, that is. But we can't understand the red lines of other countries because the U.S. is a very arrogant country. You know, when you're so powerful, uh, you think the rules apply only to the others, not to you or whatever, or that you don't have to, what you feel doesn't matter for anyone else. And so there is a kind of arrogance built into this, which is that what the U.S. would never tolerate, it expects other countries uh, to uh, accede to. And Putin said, no, you know, this is our, my backyard, Russia's backyard. We don't accept NATO here. And more to the point, in the Cuban Missile Crisis, when uh, the Soviet Union, after the U.S. invasion of Cuba, responded by Khrushchev putting uh, offensive nuclear weapons into Cuba, which was a very reckless thing. But Khrushchev wanted to teach the Americans a lesson. Uh, he wanted to say, you have missiles pointed at us in Turkey. We will have missiles pointed at you in Cuba. You invade Cuba, we'll defend Cuba. So Khrushchev was trying to do politics in this way, but in a very clumsy way. As soon as it was discovered that those missiles were there in mid-October 1962, <coughs> everybody in the U.S. leadership said, well, we've got to go to war. Uh, and uh, Kennedy organized an executive committee to consider the options. And everybody said, okay, well, there's no, the only decision is, is it war on Thursday or war on Saturday or war on Monday? You know, how do we get ready for war? But Kennedy kept saying to himself, why did Khrushchev do this? Why did Khrushchev do this? What's in his mind? I, I need to think of this from his point of view. And this was really brilliant, uh, extremely important. It ended up saving the world. Kennedy had one advisor at the beginning, Adlai Stevenson, who was the uh, US ambassador to the UN, who said to Kennedy, you have to end this diplomatically. Kennedy was shocked because every other advisor had said, you have to end this militarily. And Kennedy was also very uh, politically conscious, you know, as a political animal. Uh, he said, if I don't respond to this in a tough way, I'm going to be impeached. Uh, you know, I'm certainly going to pay a heavy political price. So on the one hand, he was told, go in and bomb. He knew something wasn't right about that. He was quite afraid uh, politically for his own circumstances if he looked too soft on this. And that's why crises like these are so unbelievably dangerous. And incidentally, the CIA had correctly spotted these missile sites in Cuba with the air surveillance, the so-called U-2 uh, spy planes, but they were wrong on so many details. They said the missiles weren't yet in operation, but many were. They said there were about 5,000 Soviet troops, but it was closer to 40,000. So many things that they thought were true were false. And the premise of how the U.S. would militarily engage was based on lots of false premises, which is also par for the course. And the reason I mention it is we've got a war going on that's a proxy war between the U.S. and, and Russia right now in Ukraine. It's extraordinarily dangerous. We shouldn't think, well, they're keeping it under control. Yeah, it's terrible for the Ukrainians, but nothing too bad can happen. As long as this war goes on, something absolutely terrible can happen. Absolutely terrible. Even a field commander, you know, often has authority to use a tactical nuclear weapon or something, or an accident happens, or somebody misreads a radar signal, or God knows what kind of thing can happen. 
miscalculation is par for the course in a crisis like this, which is why I'm insisting every day we need to negotiate this. We need to understand that NATO enlargement crossed a red line very dangerously. Putin told us that repeatedly for a dozen years. We refused to listen out of their...